My guest on this week's episode of Suds and Search is John Morris, CEO of Ramsey Innovations. John was the founder of Rise Interactive and served as the company's CEO from 2004 to 2020. John did it all at Rise. He started the company after winning $10,000 from a business school competition, scaled the business to over 250 employees, and then successfully exited. Now John is on to his next venture, Ramsey Innovations. He is using what he learned from his time at Rise to help other upstart agencies solve a fundamental problem, their finances. Simply put, the topic of financial management just doesn't come up very often at conferences or on SEO Twitter. Matter of fact, we've never had someone on the show to discuss agency finances before now. John argues that getting your financial house in order allows agency principals to be more strategic in operating their business, even if the principal's goal isn't massive growth. How does John make finance exciting to creative agency people? Why is it important to create a budget and forecast? What reports are most important to understand? I'm going to ask John these questions and many more. Grab something cold to drink and join me for a conversation with John Morris. We'll talk about how marketing agencies spend too little on marketing. We'll spend a little time talking about his excellent finance tips on LinkedIn. And John will explain why now is the time to be creating a budget for 2023. John Morris, welcome to Sudden Search. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on this. It's great to have you on. Um, you are a tough person. It's tough for me to figure out where to start with you. You started and, and scaled Rise Interactive, a big agency here in Chicago, a great reputation. You did that entire thing. You, you started it, you scaled it, and you sold it. So you had a lot of knowledge, I would imagine, from that whole process. In your next adventure, you decided to really focus not on design or creative or anything <laughs> like that. You decided to focus on finance. So I wonder if you could kind of tell people a little bit about that story, uh, how, how you started Rise, and why finance was the thing you decided to do in your next gig. Well, don't you think everyone, they when they sell their company, they dream about what they're going to do next? They're like, I want to create a finance company if I could do anything. <laughs> uh, no, so, I mean, the reality is I grew Rise from just me over 16 years to about 250 people before I exited it. And when I think about uh, why we were successful, you know, there are 120,000 agencies in the United States alone. So how were we able to scale? And the reality is I think we spent our time and our money as intelligently as we possibly could. And it came down to our financial infrastructure. We chose to have a really rigorous budgeting and forecasting process that allowed us to assess, you know, are we spending the right money in marketing? Are we spending the right money in sales? Are we spending money in the right areas? And so uh, I've been in the agency world since 1996. I love this community. I love other agency owners. And a couple of things. I thought I could help. I thought I could have fun. I happen to be good at finance and I like numbers, which is, I know, a weird thing for some people to say. Um, so don't ask me to tell the exciting stories at the dinner table. But, uh, but you know, that's how I kind of got into this. Well, I love it. And we're, we're both uh, search marketers at Rise does a whole bunch of stuff, but uh, search marketing is, is something you're very well known for. That's kind of using both sides of your brain. But I think when I think agency types, I think of that right brained, super creative type, uh, visionary entrepreneur, maybe when you when you start working with these folks, I wonder if like, how do you make finance approachable to them? How do you make it so that they can understand it and get excited about it? Uh, absolutely. So it really comes down to the first thing I try to explain to people is everyone has a strategic plan, whether they know it or not. So like when it comes to budgeting and forecasting, you can be a really strong creative type, but what you choose to spend your money on is what you determine is important to you. And so the idea is we want to make it as simple as possible. We don't want it to be overly complex. I don't want to be throwing massive amounts of numbers at you, especially if you're not a numbers person. But I want you to be spending time thinking about what you want to spend your money on. And every single one of our clients, we do a strategic planning session. And we help them determine what is their revenue goals. I have some clients that want to go from $5 million to $50 million. I have some clients that want to go from $5 million to $6 million. Yeah. Very, very different goals. And I explain to people, there's no wrong answer to that. Uh, what you need to think about is, you know, based on that information... You know, what are the right investments that you need to make? I then want everyone to have a profit goal. I want everyone to have a cash goal. And, and cash to me, I mean, I, I know everyone says cash is king, 
But if I ever ask people like, what is your cash goal? You know, I just get a, a deer in headlights type look where they have no idea what their cash goal is. But if you have a cash goal, first of all, you can have a rainy day fund and you can sleep well at night. But even more importantly, uh, you can do really cool things when you start collecting cash. You can go buy companies. You can go make investments. You can have a lot of fun if you have a lot of cash in the bank. And so we want to make sure you have a cash goal. And then the last goal that I want people to have is an infrastructure goal. And that infrastructure goal is to really help you think about what investments are you going to make that is going to make your agency better 12 months from now versus where it is today. And those investments have to be really well thought out and need to be challenged. And we help you, you know, challenge you on those things to make sure that you spend your time and money intelligently. So I think a better way of thinking about it is we're not here to help you with finance. We're here to help you make sure that you spend your time and your money as intelligently as possible so that you get the outcome that you're looking for in terms of your personal goals. Well, I love it. And I, I, I wonder about this too. Agencies are at different stages in their, in their lifespan. So some guys, yeah. some people are just getting started. Uh, you, you said you were just one person at, at the beginning up to 250 people. So yeah. each stage of that, like that infancy to adolescence to getting yeah. ready to that your, your goals are totally different. How do you kind of, help people identify where they're at and how to use their finances at each stage of that, at that process. So we generally come in when you're already around 20 employees. So, you know, we, you have to have a little bit of scale before we can, um, unfortunately, I wish we could help everybody, but that's kind of the sweet spot of where we help people. Yeah. Um, but what I can tell you is uh, there are three major milestones that every agency will hit and there's very little you can do about it. But the first one is when you go from uh, managing by yourself to managing 20 people, you're going to run your business one way. Mm -hmm. From 20 people to 100 people, you're going to run your business another way. From 100 to 250, you're going to run another way. And then 250 plus. And I'll explain the differences. When you is just you and there's less than 20 employees, you really don't have much of a leadership team yet. You, the systems you built are systems designed for you personally to run the business. Mm. But when you get to 20 employees and you go scale from 20 to 100, now you have direct reports that have to run their specific groups and their specific departments. And you have to think about the systems that they need and that they're going to be able to do to run their group. Because you're taking, let's just use budgeting software as an example. You know, when it's a one person to 20 person company, probably the owner is the only one who has access to the budget. Wow. Now you might be like, okay, I want to give this person access to the sales numbers and this person access to their department. And so you have to start thinking of the infrastructure, breaking it up into pieces. Well, when you get to a hundred, the same thing happens, except now your leaders, leaders need the tools to run their business. Yeah. And so you have to think splintering your infrastructure to support them. And then when you get to about 250, everything really becomes an ecosystem. So, you know, if you decide to switch from your CRM system to another CRM system, you have to think about, well, what's the impact of that to all the other business groups? And so that's when you start getting into ERPs and, you know, more advanced, uh, what I'll call ecosystem technologies that help fund or run the, all the different groups of your business. That's fascinating. I, I can I can relate. I mean, I can remember yeah. when it was like about 20, we were, we're 46 employees now as we're filming this. And when we got to about 20, I remember my spreadsheets didn't work anymore. They were exactly. You had to think about how do you have to help everyone else? Yeah, exactly. Well, very interesting. One of the things I want to make sure we promote before I, I get off with you is your LinkedIn. So you're uh -huh. doing these little bite sized tips yeah, uh, on a frequent basis that are really good. I really like them personally as, a, in, as an agency owner. I think anybody who is in like an executive function in an agency would find it really helpful. What tell our audience about it and what you're trying to accomplish with those with those tips on LinkedIn? You know, what I look at it as um, I'm trying generally I have a specific theme. So like right now, my theme is all about org structure. And I probably have 20 to 30 different points as it relates to org structure. And, you know, rather than writing like super lengthy blogs that might be really valuable, but 
Uh, I look at it as what I like about LinkedIn is I can get a point across in a very short period of time that I believe is going to add value, help agency owners grow, and I can get it out very quickly. And so I, I just found that it's a really powerful vehicle to communicate uh, with agency owners and, and give them really good insights into what they grow, you know, and the previous month was all about resource planning. And then I'm going to probably go into benchmarking or, you know, maybe I'll talk about like how to handle a recession. So it, it's generally themed in 30 day increments of what I'm trying to get across. Well, I love it. And I, I highly recommend it to anybody who's watching. So, um, all right, I want to, I want to ask you this. Let's say you get in, we give you access to search labs, QuickBooks, you've got a look under the hood. And you can see, you know, as much as we can show anybody about our finances, where are the first places you're going to poke around? What do you want to do at the beginning stages of an analysis? So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at your income statement. And uh, every single line in your income statement is something called a chart of accounts. And the, the main thing I want you to think about is a good finance person's job is to try to answer questions. Yeah. And the way you organize your data is going to help you determine what questions you can or can't answer. So I'll give you a really good example. Uh, if I asked you what percent of your revenue do you spend on sales and marketing, it might be easy for you to answer or it might be hard for you to answer. But the way you organize your chart of accounts will make it determine if it's easy or hard. And most companies, I would say, I've now audited hundreds of companies with about 99.9% .9 success or failure, depending on how you look at it, cannot answer that question because of the way their charge of accounts are organized. And so I have a very specific philosophy and methodology of how I want those to be organized so that I can answer a few really critical questions really quickly. I get One it. of my favorite examples, by the way, is when I was at Rise, I had an amazing CFO and uh, he came to me one day with a report and he showed it to me and I happened to be very good at numbers and he could see that I was, you know, cranking some thoughts in my head and trying to figure something out. And he just said, he's like, John, just stop. I've already failed you. I was like, well, what do you mean? He's like, the second you have to do math in your head, I know I didn't give you the right report. Wow. So tell me what you were trying to calculate so that going forward, I will always give you that report. Yeah. And so that's what I want you to be thinking about going back to your creative types, especially ones who aren't good at math and don't like math, is if we can make it so that you see a few numbers that make a lot of sense to you, you know, and you don't have to like really rack your brain, then we're doing our job well. But if you have to do math in your head, then we failed in terms of giving you the insights that you need. All right. Well, I think I don't want to make this totally personal, but one of the things that I thought was tough early on in my career was when I when I would work with my bookkeeper or something like that, it was always backwards looking metrics. It was what yeah. we had already done. It was the money we had already spent. I couldn't do anything about it. It wasn't very funny. It was only until I got into that budget and forecasting stuff that you mentioned where it really got exciting to me. Um, it got more interesting and uh, you were able to be more strategic, but there isn't really an easy report in QuickBooks that I know how to use anyway that, that helps you with that. I've, I've kind of pieced it together with different tools and spreadsheets and everything else. Um, how do you make that more accessible for people? How do, if, if people want to get in there, and they want to they want to be better at this sort of forecasting and budgeting, which I think is where all the fun happens. Um, where how, how should they do that? Do they they call Ramsey Innovations or do they, where, how else can they go about it? I mean, generally. So let me just first explain a couple of terms real quickly for for the listeners. There are three major components, as I see, to your um, finances. The first one is taxes. You want to make sure that you're paying your taxes. Your minimizing your tax liability, all that sort of stuff. The second one is what I'll, I'll put it under accounting, but it's like you're invoicing your AR, your AP, your payroll, uh, and then closing the books. Everything you just mentioned is a backwards looking thing. Paying your taxes backwards looking, uh, closing the books is backwards looking. And then there's this, what I call the fun part, which you call it the fun part as well, is all the forward looking stuff. 
And that is called FPNA, or it stands for Financial Planning and Analysis. And so whether you call someone like Ramsey up, which I think is a brilliant idea, or uh, you want to do it on your own, what you're really talking about building is building a financial planning and analysis infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And it is all about, you know, answering the questions of, you know, if I spend this much money, what will the return be? Uh, where are the investments I want to make? What do I think my business could be? You know, so it, it's future looking type stuff. Yeah. Uh, and so you need a budget and forecast. The, the more accurate your budget is, and by the way, I keep on using the word budget and forecast. So let me explain the difference there as well. well that's a good, good point. Yeah. Uh, we recommend that everybody creates an annual plan, which I'll call your budget. So if you think about it, it's about to be September. We want you to start thinking about 2023. And by November 30th of this year, I want you to have an official 2023 budget. That's a, so we're filming this at the end of August. They should be people should be thinking about their 2023 budget today. This should, this Absolutely. Should be going well, first of all, just think about it this way. If you are in paid search, and you have retained revenue as your business, the most important month is January. Because if you want a client in January, you get 12 months of revenue. If you want a client today, you're only going to get four months of revenue. So in order to win a client in January, generally you're dealing with a 30 to 60 day sales cycle, depending on the size of the business you're working with, which means that you have to win business in November, or sorry, you have to get the leads in November or October in order to win a client in January. So we are really, really close to the starting of the sales cycle of your January revenue. So the sooner you start thinking about your budgeting, the more impactful it's going to be. All right. All right. Well, I, I, I took a, uh, a detour there and started talking about budgeting. How does that differ from forecasting? What are, what are okay. the Okay. So if you think about a budget, it is a moment in time. So let's just say on November 30th, you lock in your budget. That becomes your official budget. Now, when I say lock it in, meaning like you change it to view only, nobody can edit it, nobody can change it. That is the official number. Because uh, people are going to be like, well, I thought I was going to win this client, but I didn't win them. And I was like, yeah, that's right. Now you can start comparing how do you do in January to what you thought you were going to do? How good of a job did you do budgeting? Forecasting is something you do throughout the year periodically based on different periods in time. So the first forecast I generally recommend is an April forecast, which we do at the very last day of the month, so April 30th. And what you're now going to do is you're going to lock that in. So now you can start comparing your actuals to your original plan. And, you know, three to four months of the year is done. You can start comparing, you know, your actuals to your first forecast. Then I recommend a July forecast. Then I recommend a September forecast. So there's three major forecasts at a minimum I recommend. And the reason why you want to do this is because, you know, your business is probably going to be substantially different than what you thought it was going to be on November 30th. You know, you might have had a client where you hit the jackpot, they raise a ton of money and they're investing heavily in you. You might have lost a huge client. You might have decided that you needed to hire a bunch more people to service your clients. So you had all these things that you thought you were going to do on November 30th. But as reality hit, you operated the business a little bit differently than what you originally thought. And so this gives you a chance to control your expenses and control your investments on a frequent basis. All right. Well, I had you you caught my curiosity early in the in the conversation when you said that you find that marketing agencies underspend on marketing. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of surprising. Is there anything you find that they consistently overspend on that they spend too much money on something? You know, what I would say is the most important metric is gross margin. And 90 five percent if not greater don't even know what gross margin is so let me explain it to you when you take what i call net revenue so net revenue is your revenue but you take all the pass through stuff out doesn't count so if you spend 10 million dollars in media 
and that $10 million goes directly to Google, you don't get to count that. You get to count your real revenue. So let's just say you have $5 million of real revenue. Then you have to hire employees to do work for your clients to optimize their bids, build out their tree structures, write their text ads, develop their landing pages, all the stuff that goes into, let's just say, a paid search campaign. Mm -hmm. And that plus the tools, so you might license, you know, a Kenshu or, you know, some other paid search management tool. And when that's all done, whatever is left over is your gross margin. I want agencies to be at a 50% gross margin. And most agencies don't know what their gross margin is. And when they're wondering why they're not profitable, oftentimes it's because their gross margin is way too low. And so, uh, and that generally happens because you're hiring way too many senior people who are doing junior people work or you're overstaffing accounts or you're not scoping properly. So we help dig into what is your gross margin and what do we want it to be and what's our pathway to make it better. Yeah. And that that honestly is the most powerful thing in the world. So I'll give you an example. I have a client with 62% gross margin. They are spending 20% of their revenue on sales and marketing. Wow. Now I have another client that has 36% gross margin, and they're spending less than 1% of their revenue on sales and marketing. And so the more your gross margin is, the more money you have to invest in the growth of the business. Yeah. Now, what you have to make sure of, by the way, is if your gross margin is too high, you wanna make sure that your clients are still being served and you're not burning out your employees. So although I want you to focus on gross margin, I want to make sure that we're doing it in an intelligent way that prevents churn and allows you to really grow. Yeah, I, I love this. And I, it, you, you said something that I thought of. So one of the things that's different about the finances for an agency than yeah. just about any other business is this huge human cost. So we need to hire a lot of people and we need to make sure that they're utilized and that they are uh, you know, they have enough work to do. They're not doing the junior work that you mentioned. Um, give me some the tips. Man that the managers are not, uh, have enough people to manage. So, you know, I generally have a rule of four, which okay. is that for every manager, they should have four direct reports. I find that's the uh, an ideal number where they can really dig in and, and manage them well. I've seen scenarios where, you know, you have a manager with only one direct report. So you don't get any scale out of your team if yeah. that's the scenario. Yeah, that's that's good. Do you focus on these utilization metrics? Do you focus on anything else with people when you get into there? Or is that sort of down, uh, down no, the that's a huge. That's a, so, I mean, the, the main thing that we try to focus on is your financial planning and analysis, mm -hmm. your resource planning, which is exactly what you're talking about right now, and benchmarking. And so from a resource planning standpoint, what we want to look at is it starts with your org structure. How much revenue do you want for each individual person to manage? Uh, and then it scales. So if an entry level person, let's just say you want them to manage 50,000 a month, and then you want a manager to manage 200,000 a month, and then you want a director to manage 800,000 a month. And so you can start seeing how uh, your org structure can scale accordingly. Then you want to get into utilization rates. Uh, and you should understand, you know, for, every day that you want to give someone off a of vacation, you know, or your whole company, like what's the impact of that? If you create a company meeting, what's the impact of that? Uh, if you create a new team meeting, what's the impact of that? If you have a, a new committee that you're going to form, all that takes away from billable time. And so we want to help you think about how do you maximize billable time so that your team is spending as much time as possible actually doing client work. All right, I love it. So, uh, I have I have one last question for you. If you were to advise a business that's growing quickly, when is it time to hire a CFO, controller, whatever you call top finance person in the company? When is the opportune time to get that position on the leadership team? Uh, I don't know if it has to necessarily be on the leadership team, 
What I would say is, you know, you need to be from the very beginning able to answer key questions to make sure you're spending your time and money intelligently. And so I'll give an example. My books from day one at Rise and day one at Ramsey have been in impeccable order. I take the closing of the books very seriously. I look at my budget. I have a phenomenal budget. I go through the exact same forecasting process that I recommend to everyone else. And so uh, I think it is imperative that you challenge what you're spending your money on so that you can constantly optimize it and make it better. And if you don't do that from day one, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a story. Like when I started Rise, I think it's funny, but people actually still used fax machines in 2004. <laughs> and, you know, there was e-fax at $9.99 a month. I would walk to my parents' house who had a fax machine uh, and not sign up for e-fax because I was like, if I can make 10 $9.99 decision you know, and not spend that money that equals $1,200, I could spend that on sales and marketing to scale and grow the business. And so you, you can't get more scrappy than that, in my opinion. And, and that's the idea is how do you take small amounts that can turn into big amounts and spend your time and money as intelligently as possible? That's interesting. I mean, one, one last thing, I, I'm, I'm curious about this. So at Rise, this seems so integral to how you guys manage things. Did it become part of the culture of the company? Like was the, the you know, first level manager talking about finances? How, how important was it for everyone from top to bottom? Uh, were they conversant at least in finance? I don't know if they were conversant in finance. They were very, like the four to one management structure was very well in place. Uh, there was at very key levels budgeting. We managed hours and assigned hours in a very, very careful manner. So I would say there was elements of it, but I also yeah. think that at some point my $9.99 frugality uh, was a problem. You know what I mean? And yeah. I think we had to like go the little bit of the other way of like, sometimes you lose more money by being too thrifty and you have to understand you know, look, if you don't send someone to this conference, you're ne no one's going to ever see you and ever going to grow. So there's, right. you have to balance both things. And, you know, I, I can see Larry, who's the current CEO of Rise, saying all the time, like, we just wasted more money talking about what we're trying to save than what we actually should have just pulled the trigger. And so you have to learn the right balance. I love it. Well, very good. Well, I want to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about Ramsey, we talk a little bit about Rise and uh, yeah. I think we're starting to get a sense, but let's let's kind of go over anybody who's watching who may be a good fit for for Ramsey. How how'd you get started, and, and what could people do if they work with you? Yeah, so I started a couple of years ago, um, and having an absolute blast. What we do is we exclusively focus on helping agency owners uh, with their month end close, so closing the books to make sure that the data is in the actual right order. And then we get into your budgeting and forecasting. So we ensure that you're spending your money as intelligently as possible. We then go into monthly insights, cash flow analysis, and resource planning. And that's the core service offering today. All right. Well, awesome. Well, if people want to learn more about you or about Ramsey, what's the best way? What's the best place to go? What's your favorite social media? So they should go to RamseyInnovations.com or, as you mentioned earlier, follow me on LinkedIn or connect with me on LinkedIn. I have about 26,000 followers. Most of them are marketers where I'm trying to communicate with them on best practices to grow their agency. Well, awesome. Well, you are uh, a fount of knowledge on all things finance for, for agencies and a really fun guy to have a beer with. So thank you for coming on here and uh, I hope to, hope to run into you again soon, John. Excellent. Thanks so much for having me again. All right. For everybody else, we'll be back next week with another episode of Sesson Search. Thanks, John.